In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated light from darkness. From that time, and even till now, God has been sending his light, and with it he's been pushing back the darkness. This is our history, a history where God has given his light and where we as his people, his creation, choose darkness instead. God gives light and we choose darkness and we choose darkness, yet God sends his light still. God the creator was there in the beginning. He is our beginning and in his beginning he gave us his light. And our first fall, our first choice, our first decision for darkness was that of Adam and Eve, who given the opportunity to walk in the cool of the day with God chose instead to become like gods themselves. They chose darkness over light. But even then at our first fall and since then with every fall we've had since, God had a plan from the moment we fell. God knew that we could if we only knew his light. And so God spoke to the man Abram who heard his voice and looked to the stars, the lights in the sky and heard about a promise, a promise that we could be his, that he could be ours, his light came about. And Abraham gave his promise to his son Isaac, who gave it to his son Jacob, who gave it to his children, who became the children of God. The light was passed on. These people were in Egypt and they came again into darkness. They cried out and the God who gives light heard their voice and he gave his light again to a man named Moses who led the people of God out of darkness, out of Egypt, towards the promised land. And God gave his people the word, the light, to show them how their sin led to death and darkness. He gave us the light of the book in Leviticus to show us how numerous the law was and how hopeless it is to try and save ourselves by the law. He gave another light in the book of Numbers to show how his love goes from generation, his light from generation to generation to generation and on. In the book of Deuteronomy, he gives the light again and says that he is charging us to remember our God, the God who gives light in the darkness. In Deuteronomy, he charges the people, don't forget your, your God. Don't forget to serve him. Don't forget what he's done for you. These were the first five lights, the steps that God gave to people who choose darkness over God. There's a history to follow in Joshua where this leader conquers the promised land and then judges with great turmoil. There's the book of Ruth and hope that comes with it. There is the book of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, all detailing of people who have the light and yet still choose darkness, of kings who come and go, who choose and choose and choose darkness, but a God who gives light nonetheless. There are prophets, there are warriors, there are people in history who still look to the light, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. All of our history is a history of people who choose darkness and God gives light. We have the books of poems, we have Job, we have Psalms, we have Proverbs. 
we have Ecclesiastes, we have Song of Solomon, all these are expressions of a people in darkness looking to a God of light, sharing with him our griefs, our sorrows, our failures, and declaring his faithful, faithful love that endures and endures, his light will go on. We have the books of the prophets, these people who heard God's voice, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations. We have Ezekiel, Daniel, people who heard God's word, who spoke to a people who chose darkness and said, return, come back, hear God's word, know his light, come back to God. We have great darkness, great captivity, broken lives, and a God declaring, come back. We have the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah saying the same things. We have, we have Jonah, we have Micah, we have Nahum all declaring God is still here. We have Habakkuk, we have Zephaniah, we have Haggai, we have Zechariah, we have Malachi. Prophets, people, hearing God's word, declaring our darkness, declaring our sin, declaring God's goodness, and declaring that God is sending a light even bigger. A light that will shine on all mankind, that will shine in every heart if we hear and if we see. From the time of Genesis, of Adam and Eve to the day of Malachi. God's light, his word, lit the steps of mankind. And then there were 400 years of silence. The people of God must have wondered, where is God? Where is his voice? Where is his light? Where is his revelation? In this time of great silence from Malachi to Matthew, there was no Pentateuch renewed. There was no book of history. There were no expressions of prayers and songs. There were no prophets uttering hope in the darkness. One might think that God was displeased, upset, perhaps angry. Where is God in this silence? Where is God in my silence? Where is God in my hurt, my confusion? Where is God now? Why is he silent? Why won't he speak? Why won't you do something? But it would be a a hasty conclusion. Perhaps God was not silent because he was upset and maybe not because he was angry. Maybe he wasn't silent because of our mistakes. See, that had been our nature from the beginning. No, God might have been silent because he was at work. One author, Ray Stedman, suggests that like in a play when the curtain goes down between scenes and it seems nothing is happening behind the curtain, there is somebody putting together the next scene so when the curtain comes up, it's ready for the next act. In those 400 years, you have to understand that the people of God, captive to Babylon, were taken back and allowed to go back to Jerusalem, the promised land. And that Babylonian empire was defeated by the Persian empire which was foretold in Daniel 7 verse 5, a great bear arises in the west. And that Persian empire then went on to be defeated by a little country that was coalesced by a king named Philip who had a son, maybe you've heard of him, Alexander. And Alexander defeated the great Persian army and, and was on his way to conquer all the lands he could see. On his way to Egypt, he was ready to conquer the Israelites to lay siege of Jerusalem. Josephus, the historian, tells us that, that a godly man, Jadua, a priest, gathered other priests and headed out to Alexander the Great to meet him dressed in white, holding the word of God. 
In these 400 years of silence, it would be a mistake to think God was not moving because as they went towards the army, Alexander himself came out undignified in his act and rushed towards the priest and he said to them, I've had a dream last night that a man in white would give me a vision of what to expect. Jadua opened the scriptures of Daniel and shared them with him and Alexander was amazed at the accuracy of the prophecies that it too talked about him. You see, yes, there was silence, but God was using the noble and the ignoble to shape history for the great dawning that was to come. And from that time of Greek domination, there was also the Septuagint. The Bible was translated in a language anyone could read, almost anyone could understand. And Rome came in and entered this shift in history to the West, and the Romans, while cruel and, and polytheistic and, and pagan in so many ways, they paved the way for the Messiah. Because they ushered in the first and maybe only time of world peace, they had roads that reached to all the known world and they could let the light go anywhere. But you see, the people of God had to wonder, why is God silent? Where is his voice? Why won't he speak? In silence, can I submit to you, maybe God isn't upset so much as he's active. In our times of wondering where is God, can we know that God is always with us? His light will always lead us home. From the days of Genesis to Malachi, the light was there. God's light pushing back the darkness. Enter an unknown man named Zechariah. Not a man of great repute or importance, but a man that followed God. And he, like most of his kin and people, were waiting for a Messiah. The silence was so great, deafening even. Where is God? They had a hope for a savior. It would be easy to look at this stained glass like we do at times in ancient churches and think that they're just images, one-dimensional pictures of days gone by and things that happened once upon a time. It'd be easy to think about the Christmas story the same way. These are just people that happened to be there, that had some reason to be used by God and we would miss the point of God's story and His light. Over the next few weeks as we walk through the Advent and listen to the coming Savior, I want to encourage you to look at it from a better light. A vantage of people who were desperate for God, desperate for hope, desperate in the darkness. I'd like to read to you from the book of Luke now, the account of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to this custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time of the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were, were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you and to many. 
and they will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine and other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you the good news. And now you will be silent, you will be silent, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words which will come true at the appointed time. And you will be silent. Who is this man, Zechariah? Why was he chosen to be the first possibly to hear God's voice, his message through the messenger Gabriel? It would be a mistake to look at Zechariah and assume he's a one-dimensional character with no flaws, no mistakes, no doubts, when in fact he's all of those. His life might be the same as yours. It might have similar components. And your life may seem like Zechariah's one dimensional. You may be like Zechariah in darkness and in silence, hoping, expecting, wanting, praying, not knowing, does he hear me? As the story goes on, Zechariah, unable to speak, leaves the temple. The people don't know what's happening. He makes signs to speak. His wife, when he comes home, conceives a child and she rejoices. And for the months of her pregnancy, Zechariah is silent. His tongue is held. And Elizabeth, cousin to Mary, greets her when she visits Mary, knowing in her womb she holds the Savior of the world, the light of the world. And as she comes to Elizabeth, Elizabeth's womb leaps. John, inside of her, is taken with the Holy Spirit and they rejoice on the day that John is born his kin come and say let's call him Zechariah after his father and Elizabeth says no his name is John and confused they say there is no John in your line why would you name him John they go to Zechariah and ask him shouldn't his name be Zechariah and he takes a tablet and writes no his name is John and his mouth is open, his tongue is set loose, and he does not complain, he does not doubt, he is not confused, he praises God. And the people around are amazed, and they store this up in their hearts. And Zechariah, moved by the Spirit, this somebody, really a nobody, in a people that were lost, aimless, hoping, wondering, He begins to prophesy there had been no prophecy for 400 years. What happened inside of him in the silence, we don't know. We can only benefit from what came out when his mouth was loosed. Blessed be the Lord, said Zechariah, the God of Israel. He came and set his people free. He set the power of salvation in the center of our lives. And in the very house of David, his servant, just as he promised long ago through the preaching of his holy prophets, deliverance from our enemies and from every hateful hand. Mercy to our fathers. As he remembers to do what he said he would do in the days gone by. 
what he swore to our father Abraham, a clean rescue from the enemy camp. So we can worship him without a care in the world. Made holy before him as long as we live. And you, my child John, prophet of the highest will go before, ahead of the master to prepare his ways, present the offer of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of their sins and darkness. Through the heartfelt mercies of our God, God's sunrise will break in upon us, shining on those in the darkness, those sitting in the shadow of death then showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. Zechariah is a man. Elizabeth is a woman. They are not unlike you and I, though we tend to give them a distant position and place. They're just like us. And just like Zechariah who had questions and doubts, prayers and hopes, God wants to share with us his hope, his light. This Christmas season, in the weeks to come, we're gonna walk through this Advent, the story of Jesus' birth. And I know well that we often hear the story and have comforting thoughts, heartfelt feelings. But I believe sometimes we leave this message in a children's storybook and forget that this is a powerful story of silence and hope. A story of broken lives made whole by the coming Messiah. Of a people lost and fumbling in the darkness and a God who sends his son, the light of the world. Each week we'll go through a stained glass character, but they're not characters, they're people like you and me who have this light that shines upon them and now through them. My hope is that for everyone that comes and everyone we invite and everyone that happens in, that this won't be a time to necessarily even hear a word so much as it is to see a picture of how God makes our world brighter through His Son, Jesus. And like Zechariah, who hoped against hope, and Elizabeth, who was at the point of hopelessness, God sends His light. Today as we begin this, I, I feel impressed to share an opportunity. That maybe there are some of us in a place of maybe darkness or confusion. In silence like Zechariah, maybe you've not been able to speak or not been able to hear and just wondering where is God? Where is God? And your prayers, though you give them and though your life may reflect righteousness, you don't know if He really hears. I want to ask you, if you're physically able, would you stand to your feet? The next few weeks, we'll take time to view these lives. And again, my hope is that you look for God's light and that you let Him shine upon you and that your heart is encouraged as God makes His face to shine upon you and that in the process, we understand that God sent His Son to be the light and to make us the light of the world. And today, I believe the opportunity is very, very clear and very, very simple. I believe that there are Zechariahs and Elizabeths here today, men and women who are asking for hope, praying, praying, praying for light. And like Zechariah or Elizabeth, it would be a risk for you to trust and to believe, to hope against hope. But I believe today God is asking for you just to open yourself up to Him. And I ask you if you would, just for the sake of um, those that need to respond, would you dip your heads for just a moment, every head. 
If it's you and you're the only one, I want to tell you today, God would do this for you. He would find you in the house of God like he did Zechariah, and he would send you hope. He would tell you, he would send you hope, and your heart could be different. Don't be afraid of the silence. Maybe like those 400 years, God isn't upset and angry. Maybe he's active. Maybe he's shaping the things around you to bring about his promise for you. So today, if it's one, if it's a hundred, it is a moment that God is giving you to have his light again. If tonight, today, you say, I just need hope, I need light, I need to know that God hears me, God is there, I need to know. Would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray with you. So many raising their hands. Keep them up for just a moment. As you raise your hand, I want you to make that a sign of surrender to God, just saying, God, I'm here. God, I'm here, God, I'm here, and I'd like to pray with you today. God, I thank you for your faithfulness. You are the one that sends the light in our darkness, and though we've chosen darkness at times and fell upon hard times, God, you are faithful, you are faithful, you are faithful, God. And Father, I'm praying for those people with their hands held high, surrendered to you. I believe in you, God. I believe in your love and your light and the hope you've given us in Christ Jesus. But we grow weary. Even young men and women, we fall and, and we stumble at times, but you increase the strength of the weary. You cause those that are low to soar. And today, God, I, my prayer is this. Would you help these people soar today? If their prayers seem muted, if their voices seem quiet, God, share with them. Show them that you hear. God, I'm praying that more than a little light, I pray that the dawn would come, God, that these people would awake to the hope of Jesus Christ, and that hope would come alive inside their lives, God. And this Christmas season wouldn't be a story, it would be a change in history. We have you to ask and we have you to believe in, God. Will you do that in our hearts and in our lives? Would you help us know your light again? And walk the path of peace, of joy. God, you send your light. You are good, you are good, you are good. God, you are good. You have always been good. You will always be good. We set our eyes on you and we ask you now, show us the way. I believe God is ministering to hearts right now and I don't want to be abrupt. In just a moment, we'll open up a time where if you need more prayer, you'd just like to respond to God. Would you feel comfortable? Please come forward and just spend some time with God. I would love to pray with you. I know pastors and others on the prayer team would love to pray with you if you'd like. But ultimately, this is more than just a story. It's, it's God's character. It's God's way. He is the light. Today, if you'd like prayer, please come. If, if you have an opportunity, I encourage you over this course of the season, begin to pray that God will be brighter, that you begin to see him moving, not only in your life, but in those around you. We're excited about the few weeks that lead up to Christmas and Christmas itself, because we believe God is gonna do a work in every heart and a work in our city and our world. Thank you so much for being here today. Feel free to worship and come forward and pray if you'd like. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.